welcome to our lecture on the adrenergic drugs or the sympathomimetic drugs. This lecture was taken with permission from the lecture of Dr. Nirvai Kumar of the Bihar Animal Sciences University in India. How do we define adrenergic drugs or sympathomimetic drugs? So when we say uh, sympathomimetic drugs, so these are drugs which mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So of course that is a fight or flight response or those of catecholamines. So again, when we say catecholamines, this refers to our norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine, as well as isoproterenol. So their effects are due to the stimulation of the adrenergic receptors. It could either be direct or indirect on the effector cells, hence also called as adrenergic drugs. So again, when we say adrenergic receptors, of course, we have to review you know, what are the different types of adrenergic receptors and their functions to be able to understand the effects of the sympathomimetic drugs. So, of course, for the adrenergic receptors, we have the alpha-1 to alpha-2. We also have for the beta receptors, we have the beta-1 and the beta-2 receptors. One way we're in, we are going to classify the adrenergic drugs is based on their chemical structure. So, we have those adrenergic drugs that are considered to be catecholamines, and uh, this includes epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and isoproterenol. So, of course, these three, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, are, uh, of course, endogenous, and isoproterenol is a synthetic one. Uh, we also have those that are non-catecholamines, so this includes phenylephrine, ephedrine, amphetamine, tyramine, and others. We can also classify the adrenergic drugs according to their MOA. So, we have, hope we have those uh, adrenergic drugs that act directly, so they are considered to be direct acting agents. Uh, direct acting agents because they act directly as agonists on the alpha and or the beta adrenergic receptors. Examples are epinephrine, norepinephrine, and isoproterenol. We also have those that act indirectly, so they are classified as indirectly acting agents. They act on the adrenergic neurons to release noradrenaline, which then acts on the adrenergic receptors. Example of this is the tyramine. So again, in this case, uh, we have to understand that the adrenergic neurons are the ones that contain the synaptic vesicles that, that uh, has you now the uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine. So for example, when the, these drugs will bind to the receptors that are present on these adrenergic neurons, what they do is they will stimulate these neurons to release norepinephrine or noradrenaline to the synapse and this noradrenaline now will be able to act on the adrenergic receptors of course that could be alpha or the beta receptors again uh, under this we have the tyramine we also have those uh, adrenergic drugs that acts by either direct directly uh, acting as an agonist or indirectly by stimulating the adrenergic neurons to release norepinephrine, and they are called as mixed acting agents. Uh, under this, we have the ephedrine. This uh, diagram shows the classification of the adrenergic drugs based on their mechanism of action. So the first classification and the one that is uh, clinically important is the direct acting adrenergic drugs. Again, they are called as direct acting because they directly act on the adrenergic receptors, alpha or beta, and they act as an agonist. When we say agonist, those are drugs that has an affinity to the receptor, it will bind to the receptor, and it will stimulate or it has an intrinsic activity to that particular receptor. So under this, we have the alpha and the beta agonist. And for the alpha agonist, we can further classify them as either non-selective or selective. Again, when we say non-selective alpha agonist, these are the drugs that will either you know, uh, stimulate the alpha-1 or the alpha-2 receptor. Uh, for the selective one, we have those that are either alpha-1 agonists, so they, they will only uh, affect you know, the alpha-1 receptor, alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, but not the alpha-2. And we also have those that are only alpha-2 agonists, so meaning that they will not influence the alpha-1 receptor. So for the examples of the non-selective alpha, alpha agonists, this includes the, again, epinephrine and norepinephrine or endogenous catecholamines. For the alpha-1 agonists, we have the phenylephrine. And for the alpha-2 agonists, we have the xylacine, 
uh, what that is uh, one of the most co common. We have also the clonidine, the tomidine, and the meditomidine. Uh, for the beta agonists, again, they have um, affinity to the beta receptor and they will have an intrinsic activity or efficacy to that particular receptor. For the beta agonists, we can classify them as either non selective. Of course, when we, again, when we say non selective, it can either stimulate the beta 1 or the beta 2 receptor. Uh, so an example of this is the isoproterenol and the epinephrine. For the selective ones, we, we have those that are uh, that will only uh, stimulate, for example, the beta 1 receptor. And these are the beta 1 agonists. So under this, we have the dobutamine. And we also have those that will only influence the beta 2 receptor. So this is um, selective, no beta 2 agonist. Under this, we have the terbutaline salbutamol and daclinbuterol. So of course, for us to be able to understand the effects of these drugs, we have to understand the biological activity of the receptors. For the alpha-1 agonists, now of course, uh, these mainly subserve vasoconstriction because they are mainly found on the blood vessels. For the alpha-2 agonists, of course, they are uh, they are mainly inhibitory. Uh, they are mainly inhibitory in nature you know, because they are mainly um, found on the adrenergic neurons. For the beta-1 receptor, of course, they are, they are mainly uh, found on the heart as well as in the kidney. For the heart, for example, the beta-1 receptor is mainly responsible for the increase in heart rate, increase in the heart contraction. For the beta-2 agonists, of course, uh, beta-2 receptor, rather, they are mainly found on the uh, lungs, particularly in the bronchi. So in the bronchi, they will promote uh, bronchodilation. Uh, we, aside from that, we also have those that are indirect acting adrenergic agonists. So again, they act on the adrenergic neurons to increase the release of the uh, norepinephrine. Right? Under this, we have the tyramine and the amphetamine. We also have those that are mixed acting, so they can act directly or indirectly. Under this, we have the ephedrine. Pharmacological effects of the adrenergic drugs on different bodily systems, starting with the heart. So, in the heart, they will increase the heart rate and increase the force of cardiac contraction. So, the heart rate is also known as the chronotro chronotropy, so that is the other term for the heart rate. You know? So, when there is an increase in heart rate, that, is, that also means or that is also synonymous with a positive chronotropic effect. And again, um, the adrenergic drugs also increase you know, the force of cardiac contraction. So the other term for this is, again, inotropy. So when we say inotropy, that, that relates to the cardiac contraction. So when there is positive inotropy, so that, that would also mean an increase in the force of cardiac contraction. So for the adrenergic drugs, you know, particularly those drugs that are um, beta-1, beta-1 agonist and the alpha-1 agonist. So they basically increase the heart rate and the um, cardiac contraction. So, of course, when they do this, uh, they will increase the blood pressure. So in the case of the beta-1s, of course, the beta-1 receptors are mainly found in the heart. The alpha-1 receptors are mainly found in the blood vessels. So uh, when we are going to stimulate the alpha-1 receptor, they, they will... They will uh, constrict the blood vessels, so they will increase the blood pressure. When we are going to stimulate the beta-1 receptor, of course, they will increase now, the heart rate and the force of cardiac contraction. For the blood vessels, um, these, the blood vessels are mainly distributed. Uh, the, the blood vessels mainly contain the alpha-1 receptor, but also the beta-2 receptors. So, of course, they will... Um, they will induce vasoconstriction that is mediated by the alpha-1 receptor in the blood vessels and also vasodilatation in through the beta-2 receptors. So, of course, the beta-2 receptors are mainly found in the blood vessels that supply the skeletal muscles, the lungs, and the mesentery. So, these are the organs that are important for survival during a fight-or-flight response. For the respiratory tract, the adrenergic drugs will induce relaxation of the smooth muscles of the bronchi in the trachea. So, of course, you know, there will be um, bronchodilatation that is uh, similar to that of 
the fight or flight response. So epinephrine and isoproterenol are considered to be potent bronchodilators but not norepinephrine. For the GIT, uh, they will decrease the tone and the motility of the GIT smooth muscles and this will be mediated by the alpha-1 and the beta-2 receptors. For the eyes, um, it, the adrenergic drugs will induce mitriasis or pupillary dilation to, due to the contraction of the radial muscles. Uh, this is mediated by the alpha-1 receptors. For the metabolism, what adrenergic drugs will do is that they have metabolic effects like hyperglycemia. So again, when we say hyperglycemia, that is, of course, an increase in the blood sugar level, an increase in the glucose in the blood, and that is mediated by the alpha-1 and the beta-2 receptors. Uh, this is due to the glycogenolysis. Of course, uh, glycogenolysis is a breakdown of glycogen that is found, uh, for example, in the liver. So it will release more glucose in the blood that is important as a source of energy for, uh, for example, during a fight-or-flight response, and that is under the sympathetic uh, nervous system. There is also hyperlipemia due to uh, lipolysis. For the spleen, so for the splenic capsule, there is contraction of the splenic capsule through the alpha, alpha 1 receptor, and uh, more RBC or more blood are poured into the circulation. So, of course, the spleen is important for the RBC in the production. The blood is important uh, during, for example, a fight or flight response that is, uh, of course, under the sympathetic nervous system. For the CNS, CNS stimulation causes respiratory stimulation, wakefulness, increase in psychomotor activity, and anorectic effect. Some of the clinically important sympathomimetic agents and their clinical uses. We start with adrenaline or epinephrine and noradrenaline or norepinephrine. So these agents reverse hypotension. So when we say hypotension, that is a decrease in the blood uh, pressure brought about by a decrease in the blood volume. And um, because they reverse this condition, hypotension, they are also known as pressor amines. So meaning that they will induce the increase in the blood pressure, they will induce hypertension. Uh, in the case of uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, they are best given via the IV infusion. It causes generalized vasoconstriction with increase in the peripheral resistance and increase in the blood pressure. In the case of epinephrine, they will induce myocardial stimulation and disordered rhythm of the heart or arrhythmia. So for this reason, the epinephrine is not given IV. So adrenaline and nor, uh, noradrenaline is mainly used uh, with local anesthetics. So this drug will potentiate you know, the local anesthetic action by decreasing the absorption of the local anesthetics. Another is uh, these drugs will also act as a local hemostatic you know, because they arrest bleeding due to their local vasoconstrictive effect. Uh, they are also important in allergic and anaphylactic reactions and acute bronchial asthma. So again, epinephrine is considered to be a drug of choice you know, for anaphylactic reactions. It reverses the acute hypotension and it will dilate the respiratory passages. So in the case, for example, of a bronchial asthma, there is actually contraction of the airway, there is bronchoconstriction, and this will be reversed by epinephrine. So because epinephrine will induce bronchodilation. Uh, of course, these drugs are also used as a cardiac stimulant. Uh, they are used in the treatment of acute cardiac arrest, AV block, no, or the atrioventricular block. So we also have uh, another sympathomimetic agent, the ephedrine. So ephedrine is actually a mix-acting mix -acting, uh, sympathomimetic agent. It is considered to be 100 times less potent than adrenaline but longer lasting. So it was previously used as a bronchodilator, vasoconstrictor, a heart stimulant, a midriatic, and a CNS stimulant. So another drug is the amphetamine. It is a synthetic, orally active, largely indirect acting alpha and beta agonist, having euphoria and habit-forming properties in man. So it is an addicting drug in man. Uh, it has been used by athletes and given to race horses to improve performance illegally. So this is known as doping. 
when they are using a drug in order to, to enhance the performance of the race horses. And that this is uh, illegal. <clears throat> so for the central effects of amphetamine include alertness, increase in concentration and attention span, euphoria, talkativeness, and increased work capacity. Of course, this is in humans. The fatigue is allayed, and hence athletic performance is improved temporarily followed by deterioration. We also have phenylephrine. So phenylephrine is a vasoconstrictor because it is mainly an alpha-1 agonist. Uh, it is used in hypotension in local anesthetic formulations. It is also used as a decongestant and in ophthalmology as a 10% solution when pupillary dilatation with loss of accommodation is required. Another is the isoprenylene. It is also called as isoproterenol. So isoproterenol is a synthetic mixed beta agonist, meaning that it acts on the beta-1 and the beta-2 receptor. Because of this, it is also known as a bronchodilator, of course, that is via the beta-2, and a cardiostimulant that is via the beta-1. So again, this drug, unlike that of the endogenous ones, are resistant to MAO, but metabolized by COMT. So MAO is uh, monoamine oxidase, COMT is catechol or methyltransferase. Uh, these are bronchodilator action that is used you know, to, uh, for asthma in humans, and it also has a powerful cardiostimulatory action via beta-1 to accelerate the ventricular rate in heart blocks. Another is salbutamol or the albuterol. So this drug is a bronchodilator because it is a selective beta-2 agonist, meaning that it will only influence the beta-2, not the beta-1. So again, the beta-2 is mainly found on the uh, bronchial smooth muscles. Uh, it acts on the bronchial smooth muscle, on the vasculature, and the uterus. So the drug is lacking the undesirable acardius excitation side effects of isoprenaline or isoproterenol in asthmatic patients. So again, when we are going to compare this with isoproterenol or the isoprenaline, so salbutamol is a selective beta-2 agonist. Isoproterenol is a mixed beta agonist. So ibig sabihin, the isoproterenol will also influence the beta-1 and it is also a cardiostimulant. So, uh, of course, the isoproterenol has an adverse effect. No, meron, it has no an undesirable cardio excitation side effects uh, that is lacking in the salbutamol. So, the drug is resistant to MAO and COMT and is having longer duration of action compared to that of isoproterenol. It is used as an inhaler by asthmatic patients. Inhaled salbutamol produces bronchodilatation within 5 minutes and the action lasts for 2 to 4 hours. We also have terbutaline. So terbutaline is a bronchodilator. Uh, another is the isosuprine. It is a tocolytic or uterine relaxant drug. And these are mainly used to um, depress the smooth muscle contraction in the gravid or the pregnant uterus. Uh, this is useful in, in cases of threatened abortion. So isosuprine is a selective beta-2 agonist. In the case of the clenbuterol, it is a selective beta-2 agonist. It is having a tocolytic and a bronchodilator actions.